Hi there, I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, an independent online Catholic news source. You can find us on the web at www.cruxnow.com. That is cruxnow.com. I am also a proud fellow at the Word on Fire Institute of Bishop Robert Barron. You can find all of their compelling resources on the web at wordonfire.institute. That is wordonfire.institute. Welcome to another episode of The John Allen Show, brought to you by the great people at Word on Fire. Today, we are going to be talking about what I regard as not only the most dramatic Christian story of our time, but certainly the most underreported, under-talked about, under-focused on uh, Christian narrative, and that is anti-Christian persecution around the world. In fact, I think you could make an argument that over the last few decades, Catholicism has suffered through two major generational traumas. One is, of course, the clerical sexual abuse scandals, obviously no shortage of reporting, commentary, conversation there. The other is the growing scourge of the persecution of Christians, very much including Catholics, uh, all around the world. Uh, and the, the unfortunate reality uh, is that the former trauma uh, often receives far more attention than the latter. Now, before we dive into this conversation, there are two important caveats we need to read into the record. One, we are going to be focusing on anti-Christian persecution, not because Christian lives are more valuable than anybody else's. Obviously, the Catholic Church is committed to religious freedom across the board. The unfortunate reality, however, is that there is often a wall of silence that surrounds the suffering and persecution of Christians that does not apply to other religious communities. The Western mind is perfectly ready to accept anti-Semitism, for instance, the, the persecution of Jews uh, as a real and present danger. The Western mind equally is ready to accept the idea of Islamophobia, hatred of Muslims, and therefore persecution of Muslims uh, as something we have to be on guard about. Often the persecution of Christians does not compute uh, in quite the same way. Uh, and so the, the reason for focusing on anti-Christian persecution is not to elevate Christians above others, it is instead to attack that wall of silence. And further, there is both a theological and a practical argument uh, for this focus. The theological argument goes all the way back to St. Paul who wrote that the suffering of any member of the body is the suffering of the entire body. Now, either that is simply pious rhetoric, or it means something. And if it means something, then Christians obviously are called to, to speak out and do what they can. The practical argument is that if Christian leaders and Catholic leaders, if they don't speak out on behalf of their sisters and brothers of the faith, their fellow Christians, uh, it's hard to imagine who else is going to do so. Now, secondly, uh, although I have just laid out uh, Christian arguments for this focus on the persecution of Christians, uh, I think it is also important to note you do not at all have to be a Christian. You don't have to have religious faith to recognize the persecution of Christians around the world as one of the defining human rights scourges of our time. Uh, you didn't have to be Jewish uh, in the 1960s and 70s to recognize the persecution of dissident Jews in the Soviet Union as a major human rights issue. You didn't have to be black in the 1980s to recognize the apartheid system in South Africa as an offense to the conscience uh, and to mobilize to do something about it. And in similar fashion, you do not have to be Christian today to recognize uh, that statistically, both qualitatively and quantitatively, the persecution of Christians around the world has reached epidemic proportions. Uh, it is every bit as much uh, an offense to the conscience, and it requires the same kind of human rights mobilization that accompanied those other two sort of transcendental crusades in their time. So those are the caveats. What we're going to do today is, first of all, give an overview of the reality of anti-Christian persecution around the world. Secondly, we will look at three specific hotspots. And finally, we will attack a couple of common misperceptions. So that's what's on the menu for today. Stick around as we talk about the defining Christian drama of our time, anti-Christian persecution. 
Hey everybody, it's Jared Zimmer, the director of Bishop Robert Barron's Word on Fire Institute. I hope you're enjoying the John Allen Show, which is yet another production brought to you by the Word on Fire Institute. I want to take a few seconds just to invite you to become a member of the Institute where we offer numerous different aspects that can help form you as an evangelist. Things like courses on theology and philosophy and psychology and sociology. You also receive a quarterly journal in the mail throughout the year. Another exclusive offer that we'll be having if you enjoy The John Allen Show is a live Q&A with John where you can ask questions about the culture, the church, media, etc. Uh, so when you join, you also get free access to Word on Fire Digital, uh, which houses all of Bishop Barron's feature films, topical studies, study materials, and the like. So uh, visit wordonfire.institute and come help us proclaim Christ to the culture. Hey, let's begin with an overview. Pope Francis is fond of saying, and he has on multiple occasions, that there are more Christian martyrs today than in the early centuries of the church. In fact, Pope Francis has even talked about a vast ecumenism of blood that unites the martyrs of the Catholic Church with the martyrs of all of the other Christian confessions, because the sad reality is, generally speaking, the persecutors of Christians in the world today do not make denominational distinctions. It doesn't matter to these people whether you're Catholic or evangelical or mainline Protestant or Orthodox. Uh, as far as they are concerned, you are a Christian and therefore you are a target. Now, this is one of those rare cases, actually, in which papal rhetoric can be backed up by hard statistical fact because Pope Francis is just flat out right uh, there are more Christian martyrs today, in part, of course, simply because the Christian population uh, is so much larger than it was in the early era of the church. There are, roughly speaking, 1.3 billion Roman Catholics uh, in the world today. There are about 2.1, 2.2 billion Christians. That's roughly one-third uh, of the entire human population and so simply in terms of raw numbers, uh, Christians are going to be exposed, proportionately speaking, to danger uh, with in, in term higher totals uh, than most other religious communities. I mean, if we run the numbers, estimates of the number of new martyrs, the, that is, people who are actually killed uh, for their Christian faith every year, vary wildly, uh, in part because uh, there is an ongoing debate among experts about actually what counts uh, as religious persecution. I mean, for instance, uh, suppose a Christian activist in the Amazon uh, is campaigning for respect for the land rights of indigenous persons in a way that threatens the economic interests of a major agribusiness concern. And suppose somebody in management for that agribusiness concern hires a couple of thugs uh, who go out uh, and rough this Christian up and end up killing him or her. Now, uh, that person has certainly died for what he or she would perceive as principles of their faith, but the motives uh, of the person killing him or her really had precious little to do with religion. They were economic and political. So, uh, is that martyrdom or is it? And different people will answer that question in different ways. Uh, but the high-end estimate, which comes from the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell Theological Institute in the States, uh, their estimate is that there are about 100,000 new Christian martyrs every year uh, in, the early 20, excuse me, in the early 21st century. Now, others have questioned that. Uh, an expert uh, at the World Council of Churches, for instance, uh, has provided the, the low-end estimate, which is about seven or 8,000 uh, new Christian martyrs as opposed to 100,000. But if you think about it, what that establishes is a range between one new Christian martyr every five minutes and one new Christian martyr every hour of every day of the year, 24-7, 365 days a year. Either way you look at it, that is a human rights uh, epidemic of just staggering, staggering proportions. And of course, martyrdom is simply the end of the line uh, in terms of religious persecution. There are many other forms of oppression and harassment uh, that Christians suffer. Uh, the estimate from uh, Open Doors International, which is originally a Protestant uh, human rights watchdog that focuses on anti-Christian persecution, uh, 
uh, is that two, at least 220 million Christians in the world today, uh, that's basically one-tenth of the entire Christian population, every day is exposed to the risk of arrest, detainment, uh, harassment, uh, persecution, torture, uh, ultimately, uh, of course, even death. Uh, that these are daily realities that an astonishingly large swath of the Christian population lives with. Uh, now, all of this often comes as a surprise uh, to Western observers who simply are not accustomed to thinking about Christians as an at-risk group. You know, if, if you grow up uh, in most parts of Europe or North America, you are accustomed to thinking of Christians as the majority. Uh, and the idea that they could be exposed to this kind of danger there, because you just, you, you typically don't see it. Uh, but in many other parts of the world, Christians are not uh, a majority. They are often an embattled minority, uh, and they are exposed to tremendous risk, not simply uh, on the basis of ethnic or confessional rivalries, uh, but also because in many parts of the world, Christianity is identified with the West uh, and therefore often is seen as the enemy. Sometimes Christian churches are seen as outposts for Western interests, for colonial uh, interests, uh, and that too uh, tends to engender backlash. Also worth noting is that a disproportionate share uh, of the victims of anti-Christian persecution, because this typically happens in the developing world, uh, they are non-white, uh, they are people of color, uh, they are more often women and children than men, uh, and they are typically poor. Uh, a classic uh, sort of example uh, of all of this would be Azia Bibi. Uh, Azia Bibi uh, was a illiterate Catholic mother of four and farm worker in Pakistan, who uh, in 2009 uh, was charged under that country's anti-blasphemy laws for having insulted the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, now, it, it, most reconstructions are that she was simply having a dispute with some other farm-working women uh, over who could access water in a well. Uh, and this business about her insulting Muhammad was really a kind of pretext simply for settling scores. But in any event, uh, she was charged with that offense. She spent a, She was sentenced to death and spent a decade on death row in Pakistan before, uh, under international pressure, she was finally freed uh, and ultimately uh, allowed, uh, under the cover of darkness, to resettle uh, in Canada, where she still has to live uh, in a kind of closeted hiding, uh, a kind of catacombs existence for fear of reprisals. Uh, now, uh, Ozzy Abibi, uh, who became, if you like, the kind of international face of anti-Christian persecution, was a perfect face for this scourge. She is a woman. She is poor. Uh, she is undereducated, uh, and she is a person of color. Uh, and that, in many ways, captures the reality on the ground in a remarkable uh, number of places around the world in the early 21st century. There is, in some ways, uh, in the title of a book that I published on this issue a number of years ago, a global war on Christians underway. It is being fought uh, on a variety of fronts, uh, and it is being carried forward by a variety of protagonists. Um, if the old mythology about anti-Christian persecution was that it doesn't exist post-ISIS, uh, the mythology has become that it is all about radical Islam, uh, but that's not true either, uh, because Christians are at risk in many parts of the world that are not part uh, of Islamic culture, uh, and where the threats come not from radical jihadists, uh, but from other radical movements, sometimes linked to religion, sometimes linked to culture, sometimes even from the state in China, for instance, uh, where Christians face a wide variety of restrictions and forms of harassment. Uh, the enemy there is not religious radicals, it is the state itself. Uh, so this is a complicated a, and very difficult to unravel phenomenon, uh, but that obviously does not make it any less real. All right, let's survey three hotspots that kind of put faces and flesh and blood, uh, if you like, on this broader phenomenon. 
We will begin in the Middle East, in Iraq and Syria. Ever since the civil war uh, in Syria erupted uh, in 2011, uh, Christians have been on the front lines of the violence and chaos that was unleashed uh, in that region. Uh, Iraqi Christians, their suffering actually predates that. Uh, in 2003, at the time of the U.S.-led invasion, the Christian population of Iraq was estimated at around a million and a half. By now, it's been reduced to somewhere around two or 300,000, depending on, you count, on how you count. There has been a similar uh, exodus uh, outside of Syria by Christians, uh, not only because of the general chaos, the violence, economic collapse, but also because they are, Christians are often specifically targeted uh, by the radical Islamic elements who are the protagonists in many ways of this conflict. Uh, priests have been killed, deacons have been killed, bishops have been killed, ordinary lay people uh, have been killed. The roll call, roll call of martyrs uh, in Iraq and Syria is staggering. Uh, perhaps the best known example of all of this came in 2014 on the Nineveh Plains in northern Iraq when the Islamic State uh, invaded what had been uh, the traditional cradle of Christianity in Iraq uh, they colonized the area. They set about killing or driving out the Christian population of a number of historically Christian villages, destroying the churches uh, and other church property, uh, and essentially engaged in a kind of campaign of ethnic cleansing, which was eventually recognized by Pope Francis, uh, by Angela Merkel, by the United Nations, and ultimately by the government of the United States as a genocide. Now, of late, uh, in what I think of as one of the most inspiring Christian stories anywhere in the world, what remains of those Christian communities uh, on the Nineveh Plains are trying to rebuild uh, after the area uh, was liberated uh, in 2017. Christians started making a kind of desperate attempt to ensure that the Christian footprint wasn't simply erased uh, from that part of the world, which has been part uh, of the Christian story since the era of the apostles. Uh, they got no public support of any kind for doing so uh, because the major international bodies such as the UN uh, and major international NGOs, all of the humanitarian aid they were distributing uh, in Iraq post-ISIS uh, was being uh, handed out through the major refugee camps run by those organizations. Christians don't go to those camps because they're afraid of being vulnerable and exposed to further uh, harassment because of jihadist infiltration. They were entirely dependent upon the church. Now, the church in Iraq does not exactly have deep pockets, but a number of large international Catholic organizations, uh, such as in the, in the Aid to the Church in Need, a papal foundation that works with persecuted Christians, the Knights of Columbus in the United States, the Catholic Near East Welfare Association based in the U.S., and others uh, mobilized to provide support for these rebuilding era effort. It is really a kind of Dunkirk in reverse. This is a civilian flotilla coming to the rescue of a trapped and at-risk group of people, but in this case, not to get them out, but to help them to be able to stay. And with the support of these largely Catholic groups, it has to be said, they have been doing heroic work. Many of these villages have been almost entirely reconstructed, uh, and there is once again a kind of thriving Christian presence there. Now, that presence is fragile, depending upon what happens in the region. Recent tensions between the United States and Iran, for example, deeply worried uh, these communities, but, as but assuming something approaching peace and stability can be achieved uh, in, in that neighborhood, uh, then it, there is great hope uh, that the Christian presence will remain. It is, it is an incredible story, and if you ever have the chance to stand in some of these places and watch what these people have done with, against all odds and with incredible courage, uh, it's, one of those, it's one of those sites that, quite honestly, makes you proud to be a Christian because this is really what Christianity is all about, shorn of any pretense of power, or privilege, wealth, and influence. This is simply fidelity, and it is hope, uh, and it is the determination that is born of that fidelity and hope on full public display. Folks, trust me, it is something to see.
All right, uh, a second place where one can witness uh, this anti-Christian persecution in kind of its fullest form uh, would be Nigeria. Nigeria uh, is the largest country in Africa. Uh, it has the largest oil deposits in Africa. Uh, it also features the world's largest mixed Muslim Christian population. Uh, you're talking about a population north of 200 million people, which is almost evenly divided uh, between Christians and Muslims. Uh, an imam in Kaduna uh, in central Nigeria, when I visited, visited it several years ago, uh, told me that Nigeria is like Saudi Arabia and the Vatican all rolled into one thing. Uh, in other words, uh, it's got this uh, incredibly strong and historic Islamic presence, uh, home to the, the fabled Sokoto Caliphates, uh, but it is also, of course, home to a thriving and mushrooming Christian presence, including a very strong Catholic community. Uh, it has been home to tensions between Christians and Muslims for some time. Uh, for a long time, they were concentrated on what is known as the middle belt of Nigeria, the central part of the country, uh, where you have Islamic uh, herders fighting against Christian farmers over land use, uh, but that has been swept up into the religious tensions between the communities. More recently, we have seen the rise of the militantly Islamic Boko Haram movement, uh, which targets not just Christians, but certainly Christians are high uh, on their targeting list. Uh, and according to all of the statistical surveys, uh, Nigeria has actually become one of the most dangerous countries in the world to be a Christian. I interviewed a group of Christians uh, in the Middle Belt uh, two years ago uh, when I was in Nigeria who told me that one of the things they have been forced to do during Sunday services is become experts at knowing how far off gunfire is when they hear it. Uh, so they now just instinctively know that when the guns start shooting, uh, if they're a certain distance away, that means they have time to finish their service before they go into hiding. Uh, if it's closer, that means they got to take off right then. Uh, it is sad but true um, that this has become a routine feature uh, of Christian life, uh, at least in some parts uh, of Nigeria. Uh, that is a country well worth keeping an eye on uh, in terms of the future direction of this issue. And finally, uh, let's talk for a moment about India. Uh, this takes us into Asia and it takes us out of the Islamic world because the majority religious tradition in India is not Islam, it's Hinduism. Uh, and over recent decades, there has been a strong current of radical Hindu nationalism uh, that is now in power in India uh, in the form of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, uh, who comes out of the RSS, which is the social and political wing, uh, sorry, the, the BJP, which is the social and political wing of the RSS, uh, which is the militantly nationalist uh, Hindu identity movement in India. Many experts talk about a growing saffronization uh, of India, uh, that is the imposition, imposition from on high uh, of cornerstone matters of Hindu identity uh, and therefore growing pressures uh, on minority communities, not just Christians, uh, but also Muslims, Jains, and others. Uh, India uh, is home to uh, what remains uh, the most violent and barbaric anti-Christian pogrom anywhere in the world uh, in the early 21st century, uh, which were the massacres of Orissa uh, in a region of eastern India known as Kandhamal uh, in 2008. Uh, Hindu radicals wielding machetes and pitchforks descended upon a series of Christian settlements uh, and essentially laid waste to the place. Uh, murdering uh, by final, the final death toll uh, was at least uh, 100 people. Uh, and there is now an active campaign underway for the beatification and eventual uh, canonization of the Catholic victims uh, in this pogrom. And it should be noted uh, that these people weren't simply shot to death. Uh, in at least uh, one case that, uh, that I'm familiar with, uh, several Christian men were rounded up and they were disemboweled by their attackers with their wives and children looking on, uh, then buried uh, up, to their, up to their necks uh, in the ground. 
uh, and kicked, sped upon, and otherwise abused uh, until they finally expired. I mean, it, it is... These are scenes of barbarity that we typically uh, associate only with the, the martyrs of the early church, the kind of barbarity uh, that we would like to believe uh, is antiquated uh, in the early 21st century, but in reality uh, is very much with us. India is also a reminder uh, that Christians are at risk in a bewildering variety of contexts, uh, and therefore, combating these threats uh, requires a multi-layered and diversified strategy. All right, finally, just a couple of common misperceptions uh, to deal with in terms of anti-Christian persecution. First is what I like to call the myth that no one saw it coming. You know, when a bomb goes off uh, in a church on Easter Sunday, uh, as has happened uh, in Nigeria on multiple occasions, or uh, in a park where Christians gather uh, to, to recreate and to eat after Mass on Easter Sunday, as happened a couple of years ago in Pakistan. Hundreds of people die, uh, and the responsible authorities always insist uh, that they were shocked and stunned uh, by this development while vowing you know, to get to the bottom of what happened. But the truth is, these sort of spectacular eruptions of violence were almost always preceded uh, by other lower-level uh, kinds of attacks. Um, for instance, uh, in Nigeria, uh, very recently, uh, there was a, the operator uh, of a Christian orphanage who was detained by authorities and sent to prison on the charge uh, of operating this orphanage illicitly, and the children in his care uh, were shipped off to state-run facilities. Now, the thing of it is, uh, this guy faced similar charges in 2002 and was completely vindicated. Uh, so most observers would say there is no legal basis uh, for this kind of uh, intervention by the authorities other than to harass him and try to drive him out of business because this is a majority Muslim region uh, of Nigeria. Uh, now, uh, you know, in the abstract, uh, whether or not one small Christian orphanage uh, is able to remain in business may not seem like that big a deal, but this is one of the early warning signs uh, that often leads uh, to larger calamities. Uh, and should that happen in this part of Nigeria, no one is going to be able to credibly claim uh, that they didn't see it coming. Uh, finally, uh, uh, another common misperception and one that is particularly pernicious uh, is that anti-Christian persecution is somehow a political issue. Uh, unfortunately, in the politics of the West, it is often political conservatives uh, who are most sensitive to just religion generally uh, and to uh, Christian values and so on uh, specifically, and who therefore tend to have the greatest interest in this issue, while liberals tend to typically a little bit more secular, but even Christian liberals who are afraid uh, of a kind of Christian triumphalism, of a kind of confessionalism, uh, tend to stay away from this issue. But the truth of it is, uh, this is not a left v. right issue. This is a human rights issue. You have a vulnerable community that is typically poor, typically minority, uh, typically without access to power or self-defense, uh, who is at risk, who is on the firing line, uh, and who need international assistance. And politics really ought not to have anything to do with it. Further, from a Christian point of view, it demeans the suffering of these people to suggest that they went to their deaths or that they went to prison, that they endured torture for some kind of political cause. Because in virtually every case, they are not trying to serve the interests of the political left or right as the West would understand it. Frankly, they don't even know what those fights are about. What they are trying to do is be faithful to their convictions about Jesus Christ and Christ's church, not to renounce their Christian identity under pressure, but rather to emulate the martyrs of the early church and remaining steadfast. They are making the ultimate sacrifice. It's something that ought to stir admiration rather than ideological manipulation. If I can use the Italian word here, the word is basta, in meaning enough, uh, enough with the political infighting, enough with trying to feed these people's suffering through the sausage grinder of left v. right debates in the West. It is time to see this for what it is, 
which is the premier human rights scourge of our time and also the premier Christian narrative uh, of our time, uh, and to do something about it, whether that is simply becoming informed, whether that's supporting some of the organizations that assist these people, whether that's trying to raise awareness uh, in your own schools, parishes, circles of influence, uh, whatever it is, uh, these are Christians uh, who, who need our help, uh, and if we don't step up, it is hard to imagine who else is going to do the job. All right, uh, you can find more background on everything we've discussed today on the Crux site, that is cruxnow.com. Also, do be checking out the terrific resources available to you through the Word on Fire Institute uh, at their website, wordonfire.institute. Keep checking in here for future episodes of The John Allen Show. And until we see one another again, have a fantastic and blessed time.